Right in the middle of the square of an ancient city, a tall obelisk stands. It's well known that the obelisk is not from here, and it is much older than the city itself. Who made it, and why? Where and when was it first erected? Historians don't have any credible answers. That being said, the known facts surrounding the history of this remarkable monument create an amazing and puzzling picture. St. Peter's Square in Rome is architectured in a very intricate way. The main axis of the square's oval is oriented precisely to the compass points. This fact is supported by the colossal marble straight cross. The main crossbar of the cross is oriented north-south and the minor one in the east-west direction. The straight cross has been overlaid by an additional oblique cross. For a long time, the hidden principles of its geometry were not clear, but now they have been established quite reliably. They are clearly linked to the trajectory of the sun across the sky. A tall needle of a granite obelisk is set at the intersection of the crossbars, and it is the geometric center of the square. It has long been used as a sundial gnomon, so the shadow of the obelisk serves as an arrow marking the time on the pavement during the day. As it turns out, the obelisk has another calendar astronomical role discovered and confirmed by researchers just recently. The square's oval perimeter is surrounded by a massive colonnade, the edges of which mark the entrance to the square. But in addition, these same edges of the colonnade mark the points of sunrise on the days of the summer and winter solstices very accurately. We will explain why that's important later, but now let's return back to our main granite hero, the obelisk in the middle of the square. The facts about it are so unusual, so they add up to a very strange and surprising picture that will be practically impossible to rationalize for modern scientists. Known today as the Vatican Obelisk, this ancient Egyptian monument of solid red granite was brought to Rome about 2,000 years ago and was already considered extremely ancient at that time. Some historians attributed the time of its creation to the pharaohs of the 12th dynasty, others to the pharaohs of the 5th dynasty, that is over 2,000 years BC. The obelisk itself, unlike other similar monuments from Egypt is devoid of any Egyptian hieroglyphs and its paternity and the date of creation is in doubt. The place of its origin was the city of Iunu, known to historians as the capital of religious worship of the country since very ancient times of the pre-dynastic period, that is, over three millennia BC, since the city also appears in the Old Kingdom pyramid texts as the House of Ra, the ancient Greeks later on began to call Iunu in their own manner, Heliopolis. It is reliably known that the city of Iunu, the very name of which is translated as obelisks or the pillars, was widely famous not only for the abundance of temples, but also for a variety of all kinds of obelisks. When the history of the 3,000-year-old civilization that was ancient Egypt ended with the birth of the Roman Empire, our granite hero, the Vatican Obelisk, immediately began to move from the outskirts of the newborn empire to the new capital of the world. It was transported straight away, following an order of the very first Roman Emperor, Augustus Octavian. Prefect Cornelius Gallus moved the obelisk from Heliopolis to Alexandria, the Egyptian capital since the time of Alexander the Great. Here, this monument adorned the main square, which received the name of the Forum of Julius Caesar from the Romans. However, after about 70 years, it was time for the obelisk to move from Alexandria to Rome. By the directive of Emperor Caligula, a huge monolith with a height of over 25 meters and weighing about 320 tons was transported on a specially built twin cargo ship across the Mediterranean Sea and delivered to the capital of the empire. 
Here, it was installed in the center of a sprawling new arena dedicated to host horse chariot competitions designed by Caligula in the gardens of the Vatican Hill. Over time, it became a kind of special architectural chic in Rome to bring from overseas and erect ancient Egyptian obelisks or at least their copies for their own glory. In total, 13 obelisks appeared here following this new trend, 8 ancient Egyptian originals, and 5 remakes made by Egyptian craftsmen. This made Rome the city with a record amount of obelisks in it. In the era of the establishment of early Christianity, however, all this ancient chic befell the well-known and sad fate of many great monuments and masterpieces of antiquity. As idols of paganism, in the 4th century AD, almost all obelisks in Rome were attacked, knocked down, and destroyed by fanatics. Almost every single one was knocked down, with only one exception, the Vatican Obelisk. Why the obelisk survived amid the pogroms and destruction is hard to say for sure, but according to a legend, after the burning of Rome, Nero unleashed the first persecution of the Christian community in which St. Peter died by crucifixion in the Vatican Circus under the Egyptian obelisk. Therefore, it was subsequently decided that a memorial, St. Peter's Basilica Temple, would be erected here. With the gradual transformation of Christianity into the official state religion, it was this place around the obelisk and the temple that later became the Vatican, the epicenter of the Roman Catholic world. The final composition of the temple overlaps significantly with the architecture of the ancient Vatican Circus. The obelisk, placed on the central axis of the arena during the reign of Caligula, is now standing next to the southern wall of the basilica. On the side alley, hidden by the walls of the temple, the high monument became almost invisible and seemed to be forgotten by everyone. It seems the idea to move the obelisk to a place of honor in front of the entrance to St. Peter's Basilica was first proposed in the 15th century by Pope Nicholas V. The real move of the obelisk happened just more than a century later under Pope Sixtus V, the last of the popes of the Renaissance. Moreover, by the initiative of this pope, all other ancient Egyptian obelisks were also found, restored from the rubble, and erected in prominent places. As for the main obelisk, Pope Sixtus imposed a stone pedestal surrounded by four lions, which made the monument 15 meters higher. Also, the sphere and the coat of arms of the Pope's family were placed near the top of the monument, depicting a star over three hills, and even higher, at the very peak, a large and noticeable golden cross was erected that could be seen from afar. All these major events relating to the transfer, erection, and decoration of the obelisk in the new place of honor in front of the temple was led by architect and engineer Domenico Fortana. But those days, St. Peter's Square looked significantly different than it does today. The square gets its current appearance thanks to a grand reconstruction which was designed and carried out by the architect and sculptor Giovanni Lorenzo Bernini. And all this was arranged 70 years later. The presence of an ancient Egyptian obelisk in the center of the square noticeably influenced the general architectural design of Bernini. He quite clearly used the monument as the central element of the entire composition, and in various ways, explicitly and implicitly, connected the obelisk with much more ancient traditions of sun worship. In the 17th century, when the Vatican Square of St. Peter, with its obelisk in the center, was shaped into its present appearance, the ability to read and understand ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs had been lost and completely forgotten. Therefore, the place of origin of the Egyptian obelisk was known either by the Greek name Heliopolis or by the biblical city of On. The city is known from the biblical story of Joseph, who married Asenath, daughter of Potiphera, priest of On. 
It was much later, in the 19th century, that the Egyptian script was finally deciphered and researchers began to compile and accumulate dictionaries for translation. Remarkable facts about our obelisks have been discovered, and these discoveries have not yet been fully discussed until today. The ancient Egyptian name of the place from where the journey of the obelisk began sounded most likely as Yunu, although the debate of of Egyptologists on this matter is underway, but whatever the pronunciation was, it is quite reliably known from the ancient texts how the name of this city looked in hieroglyphic notation. According to the famous dictionary of Wallace Budge, the most ancient variants of the name city On were as follows. Remember that Heliopolis translated as the City of the Sun and Yunu translated to Obelisks. It is important to pay attention to the following indisputable facts. Five or at least four thousand years ago, the obelisk stood in the middle of a religious center called the City of Obelisks, and the records indicate a set of hieroglyphs that describe the needle of an obelisk with a cross at the top and an oblique cross in a circle, indicating a place on the map. Today, five thousand years later, our obelisk stands, as it would seem, in a completely different geographic region and in a country with an absolutely different culture, but this place is again the main religious center, now of the Catholic Church. The monument is located in the center of St. Peter's Square, a name which literally translates as the Holy Stone. The obelisk is, again, crowned at the top with a cross and is located in the center of the oblique cross, denoting its binding to the terrain and to the movements of the sun Helios. And today, the city of Rome harbors the most obelisks in the world. There are eight ancient Egyptian and five ancient Roman obelisks in Rome, alongside a number of more modern obelisks. 5,000 years is a very long time for humanity, but not for the ancient granite obelisk as we see. It is almost like an unbeknown magic device that slowly but surely subdues people to someone else's will and in time makes them do the same thing over and over again. For thousands of years, the same thing over and over again. Now we can quite clearly observe and carefully analyze exactly what happened. But how can we explain this?